Amen. Good to see you this evening. Amen. Hope everybody's having a good week thus far. Sure. And uh, just over halfway through with it. And uh, another one will be in the books if the Lord doesn't come between now and the weekend. <laughs> but we're looking for that day. Amen. Amen it could happen at any moment. Hope we're looking for it. And uh, while we're here, nevertheless, let's redeem the time and use it for God's glory. Amen. 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 Second Peter chapter one tonight in God's word. Second Peter chapter number one. As the title of the book indicates we're coming to the second epistle of the apostle Peter this evening. And uh, of course, Peter is a minister to the little flock and in his epistles, he's ministering doctrine that is addressing issues that it will be pertinent for them in the ages to come when God has resumed his program with Israel. Over here to finish out the final installment after this dispensation of grace is completed. And we're dealing with doctrine that is relevant for that time especially. And uh, we've been working with Peter here for the last couple of weeks as we've come through his first epistle and gotten a sampling of the things that he deals with there in the first epistle. And uh, when you're looking at second Peter here in comparison to the first, of course, second Peter is a bit shorter than uh, was first Peter. Uh, you look at the chapter count. There's three chapters here of second Peter. You had five in first Peter. It's uh, roughly half the, the length and the number of words, a little bit longer than that, but uh, shorter nonetheless uh, in our authorized version here, second Peter compared to first. And uh, here in the second epistle, what we're going to see and begin seeing tonight is that the theme of the doctrine that Peter's going to be addressing is concerning some instructions for the remnant in regard to the satanic policy of evil that is going to be directed against their kingdom hope. And it's going to be dealing with matters that assault their hope as it relates to what the devil is going to be bringing upon them. And if you've been following with us through 1 Peter over the last couple of weeks, when we talk about that satanic policy of evil and its, its persecutions and its enticements for the remnant. That shouldn't be a subject, as I'm introducing that now, that is all that shocking because we know that in First Peter, there at the end, the last chapter actually, we talked about at the end last week, he actually brought up that subject and he talked about the, uh, their adversary. They've got an adversary that has a roaring lion is walking about seeking whom he may devour. And uh, Peter said some things about that there at the end of First Peter. And, uh, of course, uh, he had been dealing with uh, the, the physical sufferings for the most part and equipping them for the physical sufferings that will be brought upon them at that time throughout the epistle. He dealt with uh, the sufferings that come from the uh, apostate Jews, um, which they stand in stark contrast, um, in, in contrast to as the true Israel of God. Also, some persecutions and the physical sufferings coming from the Gentiles that they'll be suffering. But as he got to the end of 1 Peter, there in chapter 5, he commends them to the elders and their ministry, the elders that are among them. And he exhorts the elders there to be feeding the flock of God and uh, to be uh, giving them the pure word of God and the truth of the, the doctrine of the kingdom and the doctrine that the Lord had taught. And he does that not only because it's through that word of truth that these members of the remnant are going to be edified and going to be strengthened, and continue to grow in the knowledge of the Lord, uh, but also because they are facing an adversary that would like to devour them. And their only defense against the onslaught of the adversary and the deception that he's going to employ out there at that time is to be steadfast in the truth. And they're going to have to resist him steadfast in the faith, as Peter exhorted them there in 1 Peter chapter 5, and verse number 9. And uh, as he closed out 1 Peter there, he, he talked about how that in view of these things, the little flock needs to be perfected. They need to be established and strengthened and settled in these matters so that they don't fall from their own steadfastness. And uh, said a few words about that there at the end of 1 Peter, but as he's addressing that issue of the satanic policy of evil that's against him, he, he comes behind 1 Peter with his second epistle that is actually going to be given over to addressing that topic and uh, dealing with some things that the policy of evil is going to key in on and seek to uh, rattle their cage, so to speak, to, to shake them from their profession and cause them to waver. And uh, Peter needs to fortify them in that. And so Second Peter's given to that topic. And uh, just as I'm, I'm talking through that 
and we recognize that he brought up this subject at the end of 1 Peter, you might ask the question of, you know, why is this second epistle of Peter even necessary? I mean, if he's brought up the issue of the roaring lion and the, the desire that the, the policy of evil and Satan himself would have to, uh, to, to devour them and their faith, if he's acknowledged that and even given some stru instruction around that, to, to fortify them against that. Well, why do you need a, a second epistle to come behind that and to, to reinforce things that he talked about there at the end? And I think that there's really a pretty good doctrinal reason for that, and we'll talk about that here in a bit as we get into it. But uh, even before we get into some of those, those types of matters, I think that we kind of get an indication as to why it's necessary here at the end of uh, 1 Peter in chapter 5. If you look back uh, across the page to verse 12... 1 Peter 5, 12. He said, By Silvanus, a faithful brother unto you, as I suppose I have written briefly, exhorting and testifying that this is the true grace of God wherein you stand. Peter says that he's sending this letter by Silvanus, and he says, I've written briefly. And, uh, you know, when you look at it, you've got five chapters here. He's talked about a, a fair amount of things in five chapters. But really specifically in relation to what he's just said before that in verses 8 to 10 there where he talks about the devil as that roaring lion that's seeking to devour them. He's following that up and talking about the, the brevity of the letter with which he has written to them and uh, really only mentioned this issue of the roaring lion and what that's going to involve. And so because of the brevity of the letter in regard to that particular matter, it makes it practically necessary for him to come behind this and to supplement it with a second epistle that delves into that matter more thoroughly so that they're equipped uh, to handle it when it comes. And so the uh, first thing we want to do as we get into 2 Peter here is I've done with the transition between Hebrews to James and then James to 1 Peter. We've tried to key on, uh, in on some verses at the, the beginning and ending of those epistles that provide a a doctrinal link, as it were. Uh, you remember in Hebrews, after he laid down uh, the, the doctrine concerning uh, the better things that he talked about there in Hebrews as it relates to the, the new covenant and the better sacrifice and all those types of issues, he exhorted them there at the end of the book to go on to perfection. And they needed to suffer the word of exhortation, as he says. And then James comes behind that and picks up on that to give the word of exhortation. And there at the beginning of James, he talks about how that the trying of their faith, if they'll allow it to have its perfect work, it'll make you perfect and entire so that you're wanting nothing. And there's a, a doctrinal link and a sense and sequence to the, the way those books are put together and the doctrinal objectives that they have. And then likewise with the transition from James to 1 Peter, after James has dealt with the doctrinal trials of their faith, there at the end of his epistle, he begins to talk about the, the patience of Job and the example of the prophets of suffering affliction. And uh, that type of issue and begins keying in on the, the physical aspect. Once you go past the doctrinal aspect of the suffering, there's some physical sufferings that come. And sure enough, if Peter in his first epistle doesn't pick right up on that theme and start dealing with those things in particular to talk about the, the physical sufferings. And here likewise again, as we're transitioning now from 1 Peter to 2, we've seen here at the end of 1 Peter in chapter 5 where he's brought up this issue of the satanic policy of evil and the devil as the adversary that they have being against them, he's going to pick up on that here in 2 Peter and provide the doctrinal link in the chain so that he continues to develop their edification and growth. And so just wanted to show you those verses here again quickly. I've made reference to the verses here at the end of 1 Peter already, but for uh, the sake of the connection, we'll read them again. 1 Peter 5 and verse number 8. He exhorts the remnant, be sober, be vigilant. Because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour. Whom resist, steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. But the God of all grace, who hath called us unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after that ye have suffered a while, make you perfect, establish, strengthen, settle you. And so he makes reference, as we've said, to the satanic policy of evil that they need to be aware of. The fact that uh, that roaring lion is out to, the, to get them. He's looking to devour their faith. And I would have you notice here in verse number 9, as he's talked about that issue, he, he talks about some resistance. Peter prescribes resistance 
and uh, the, the method of withstanding the advances of that roaring lion as he's coming against them and he's seeking to devour them. How are they going to be able to overcome that? He said in verse 9 there, whom resist steadfast in the faith. Right? They're going to overcome by the faith, overcome by the doctrine that is being taught to them concerning these, these trials that they're going through. Now, when you think about what he's saying here, you just, you know, just think about the adversary that they have, the nature of him as a lion seeking to devour them, and the prescription for resistance being steadfast in the faith. If you know that this, this adversary is seeking to devour their faith and to, to move them away from a steadfast pres, uh, profession of it and cause them to waver... Uh, what, what do you think would be the best way for him to try to do that? Well, I think he's got to, he's got to shake that faith. Right? If the prescription is to resist him steadfast in the faith, you're going to overcome as you resist steadfast. You hold fast to your profession. You hold fast to the doctrine. And by the word of God, you overcome. If that's how you overcome, in order to be defeated, you have to not do that. Right? Not resist steadfast in the faith. And so therefore, the adversary is going to have the objective of causing them to, to waver on that profession. Causing them to, to, not, to not resist, to, to give in, and to, to really start to question the promises of God that their faith teaches them. And the way that you would do that, naturally, if you're trying to undermine someone's faith, is you're going to uh, seek to exploit any perceived weaknesses in the doctrine that that faith teaches. You're going to seek to exploit the weaknesses. You're going to try to introduce contrary doctrines. Heresies that deny the truth of what the Lord has taught to the little flock. Now you think about this in the larger context of what he's just said there at the end of chapter 5 of 1 Peter. He's exhorted them to submit themselves to the ministry of the elders. He's exhorted the elders to feed the flock of God which is among them, to give them the pure word of truth, to have them to grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ through the communication of the truth, the communication of that faith so that they can have that steadfast resistance when the devil comes in against them. If these elders are going to be teaching that, and I would submit to you that if it's through the ministry of the elders feeding the flock of God that would enable them to stand steadfast in the faith, the way that that's going to be undermined is probably going to be through some others that stand in contrast to those elders that he's exhorted, which are going to be false prophets and false teachers that come along to sow doubt and to sow heresies and to deny the truth of what the Word of God teaches and what those elders are communicating in the truth. Through the ministers and the teachings that come from those ministers, you're going to have this roaring lion seeking to devour their faith and undermining it so that they're not resisting steadfast in the faith. And lo and behold, that's exactly what we find. When we come into 2 Peter, and he's dealing with the nature of the roaring lion and the satanic policy of evil and how it's going to come to, to, to seek to weaken that resistance steadfast in the faith, it's going to be through some false teachers. If you look at chapter 2 here, verse number 1 of 2 Peter, 2 Peter 2, 1. Here he says, but there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you, who privily shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them, and bring upon themselves swift destruction. And many shall follow their pernicious ways, by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. And through covetousness they, or shall they with feigned words make merchandise of you, whose judgment now of a long time lingereth not, and their damnation slumbereth not. So the method in which the roaring lion comes to devour their faith is through the front of false teachers. They come in privily. They bring in damnable heresies, he says, and they're even denying the Lord that bought them. And you see what they're doing? They've got some pernicious ways and some pernicious motivations to what they're doing here. And he says, it's by reason of these that the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. They're speaking some things, aren't they? Amen. They're, they're teaching some things that are speaking evil of the way of truth. 
what Peter and the apostles and those elders that he's exhorting have taught them concerning the word of the kingdom and the good doctrine that will make them steadfast in their faith. There's some false teachers that come along that are denying all of that, teaching the opposite of all that, and even speaking evil of the way of truth so that the, the hearer begins to question and wonder and waver on the issue of the faith of the doctrine of the kingdom. Make it so that they're not so steadfast in their resistance in the faith. And as that happens, the lion comes in, that faith begins to be devoured. And many follow their pernicious ways. Peter says you've got to be aware of that. You've got to know how the adversary is working. He is a roaring lion, but understand he's not, he's not coming to you with a... You know, horns and a pitchfork. He's coming through false teachers and contrary doctrines that are denying the doctrine of the Lord. Yea, hath God said. This is his methodology. He says, you got to be aware of that. They're going to be speaking evil of the way of truth, trying to draw you away. Now, this issue of false teachers and their coming and the work of deception that is going to be going on, especially... Out here in a very prevalent fashion was not something that was a big surprise. Of course, the Lord himself had taught about how that this was coming and how that there would be false prophets and false Christs and those that come and speak things that are contrary to the word of God and what he had spoken. The prophets had talked about this and the great deception of this time. And so you know, the presence of false teachers and their work out in the, the, the final installment of Israel's program was certainly something that was... Um, was expected by the Lord and that should have been expected by the remnant based on things that were said. However, there is an interesting point to be made here in regard to the timing of the epistle when he's bringing this up and the, the specific things that Peter is going to key in on that these false teachers that are speaking contrary to the doctrine of the kingdom will seek to utilize to cause the little flock to, to waver in the profession of their faith. And I think that we can, we can see that. There's going to be some things that have taken place in relation to the timing when Peter's writing this that these false teachers are going to seize upon and that they're going to be scoffing at as a, as a result of it and speaking evil of the, the kingdom hope. And I think we can see that if you go to the end of Second Peter, the very end here, chapter 3. After Peter has set forth the doctrine, it's very interesting that he brings this up here. And I think that it, it tells you something about the timing of when he's writing this second epistle. <clears throat> second Peter 3 and beginning in verse 15. Peter says, An account that the long-suffering of our Lord is salvation, even as our beloved brother Paul also, according to the wisdom given unto him, hath written unto you, as also... In all his epistles, speaking in them of, thing, of these things, in which are some things hard to be understood, which they that are unlearned and unstable rest, as they do also the other scriptures unto their own destruction. Ye therefore, beloved, seeing ye know these things before, beware, lest ye also, being led away with the error of the wicked, fall from your own steadfastness. But grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be glory both now and forever. Amen. Now a few things to note there. First of all, I would point out that Peter makes a reference to Brother Paul, as he says. Amen. Brother Paul, and he, he also mentions all of his epistles. These epistles that Brother Paul has written. Now the reason I think that's noteworthy is obviously... Because by the time that Peter is writing his second epistle here, Paul has already been saved. By the time he's writing second Peter, the apostle Paul has already been made the apostle of grace. A commission with a message to go to the Gentiles. Amen. By the time Peter's writing second Peter, not only has Paul been saved and made an apostle and given a ministry, but he has written multiple epistles that are considered to be scripture. Peter is aware of this. Right? 
He knows about Paul's ministry at this point when he's writing. He knows about his conversion. He knows about his apostleship. He knows about what the Lord is doing through him as evidenced by the fact that he's written some epistles that give doctrine for what God is doing in the world through the ministry of Paul. He acknowledges that God and the Lord Jesus Christ has given Paul some wisdom in connection with some things that's going on. And that has already happened by the time that he's writing 2 Peter. Yeah. Peter's aware of all this by the time he writes. Time-wise, this means that we're at least past Acts chapter 15, in which Paul, by revelation, went up to Jerusalem there to meet with Peter and the apostles and other members of the little flock there to declare unto them his gospel and the ministry that he had out there among the Gentiles. Right, the conference has already taken place by this point. Peter is aware of it. He goes up there to Jerusalem in Acts 15 and he speaks to Peter. He talks about the revelation of the mystery and the ministry that's been committed to his trust. And he says that as he went up there and he spoke to those of the leadership of the little flock, which seemed to be somewhat. He said, they added nothing to me. Contrary wise, he went up there and he declared unto them what the Lord Jesus Christ had been had made known unto him and what he had done by his ministry and the impact that that had upon the prophetic program that Peter and the, the other uh, the, of the apostles had been called in connection with in relation to the kingdom. Galatians chapter 1, chapter 2. Right? Yeah, Galatians chapter 2, Paul talks about that. All that takes place in Acts 15. That's where Peter gets filled in on what had taken place earlier back around Acts chapter 9 when Saul of Tarsus was met by the personal appearing of the Lord Jesus Christ on the Damascus road and commissioned as the apostle of the Gentiles. Acts 15 is at least 14 years after that event based on Galatians chapter 2. Could have been 17 if you count the three years in Arabia on top of that depending on how that falls but at least 14 years after Saul's been converted you have the conference in Acts chapter 15. After, where, after Cornelius too, yeah. So Cornelius. yeah. I, I, about the, the, the middle point there. You know, years after Saul's been converted, he's gone up and he's declared to them the gospel and the ministry that he's got. And that's where Peter gets filled in on it. Now they've, they've heard of Paul and that, that, you know, the one that's persecuted him is now preaching the faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, which once he destroyed. Yeah. But they don't have the full knowledge of what's going on. They, they, don't, they don't have all that knowledge until, by revelation, Paul sent up there to Jerusalem in Acts 15, and they have the conference, and Paul declares to them what's going on, and Peter and John extend the right hand of fellowship, and, and from there things begin to shift completely to Paul, and the little flock is, of course, diminishing off, and you've got that transition there in the book of Acts. But all that to say that Peter gets filled in on Brother Paul's ministry there in Acts 15. And so we know that 2 Peter is not written prior to Acts 15. Another key point here is that the fact that he's met, uh, mentioned that Paul has written epistles, right? Multiple epistles by this time that are considered inspired scripture. He equates Paul's epistles with scripture here. And he recognizes it as such. And a, a key thing about that to understand is that Paul's epistles that are considered scripture, none of those are written before Acts 15. Now, Paul's got a ministry before that. He was converted in Acts 9. He was three years in Arabia, and he was sent out among the Gentiles, and he's been conducting a ministry among the Gentiles, preaching the gospel of the grace of God. But he's not written down Scripture until after that Jerusalem conference. Galatians is probably the earliest of Paul's epistles. Some people will tell you that it's 1 Thessalonians, and so there's some... Differing opinions on that, but regardless, if, if my understanding's right, Galatians is probably the earliest that's written around the Acts 15, 16 time frame, but it's, it's after the conference there at Jerusalem. And from that point on, as you continue through the book of Acts and Paul's got his ministry, he begins to write other of his epistles as inspired scripture. And at least, at least two of these epistles have been written by this point when he says... His epistles, more than one, you're past Acts 15, and what took place there, by some amount of time. 
And so you bring that to the context of, of you know, asking the question of why is this significant, this, this issue of timing, why is that significant to what Peter is writing here in, in 2 Peter and the fact that he's already aware of Paul's ministry and his, his message and he's making reference to that in addressing the little flock. Why, why is that significant? Yeah. Well, I think that the reason that's significant is because of what Paul's ministry was concerned with and what it meant for prophecy. When Paul was separated out there at the midpoint of the book of Acts and he's given that ministry, understand that through the ushering in of the revelation of the mystery and the dispensation of the grace of God that is dispensed to Paul for us Gentiles, what this does, as we've got it illustrated here, is it, it makes a break on this whole prophetic timeline that the little flock was called in connection with. What was happening back here in the Gospels with the preaching of the Gospel of the Kingdom? John the Baptist breaking the silence of God in the wilderness, the ministry of the Lord, the extension there with uh, repentance being offered to Israel in the first seven chapters of the book of Acts, where they blasphemed the Holy Ghost. The expectation, according to the prophetic timeline, was to go straight into this final period and the, the commencement of Daniel's 70th week and have that thing head on to the return, the physical return of the Lord Jesus Christ to the earth and the establishment of the kingdom. This whole thing right here with Paul, that the Lord Jesus Christ revealed to him in the midpoint of the book of Acts, was a mystery. Yeah. Nothing had been prophesied about that. Men of other ages knew nothing about that. God had not made it known. It had been hid in God from before the foundation of the world. God had always purposed to do it. It had always been in his plan to work that out through Christ Jesus. But he never said anything about it. It was a secret. Hid in God. Not hid in the Old Testament. But hid in God. Not made known. Amen. Amen. But now that's been revealed, hasn't it? The mystery's been revealed. The Apostle Paul has come up there in Acts 15, and he's declared to them what the Lord Jesus Christ has made known to him, and what God's doing, and why this prophetic timeline did not continue on as they expected. Amen. Now, there were some strange things happening there in relation to the prophetic timeline after about Acts chapter 7. You look, you look from the beginning of Israel's program, what God had been speaking since the world began. I mean, we, we've witnessed it all the way through there. It's been clicking along right in step, everything on time with the way that God said it until midpoint of the book of Acts. Things start getting out of whack. and They're, they're, they're kind of questioning it. P Peter himself has got to scratch his head about some of the stuff that's happening after that. It's not lining up. Something's not making sense. And for a period of years, they were in that state trying to figure this out until that conference in Acts 15 where Paul goes up and he declares it to them. And Peter had been prepared for it based on some things that had happened before. And he says, that's it. And he recognizes the wisdom of the Lord Jesus Christ that's been given to Paul. And it finally, it makes sense what's happening. They recognize him. They give the right hand of fellowship and acknowledge God has changed programs. He is doing something else. He has dispensed a hidden wisdom to the Apostle Paul that's being ministered now. And they therefore agree to confine their ministry to the circumcision. And Paul's going to go to the heathen preaching his gospel. And from that point forward, that's what you see taking place there in the book of Acts. And the emphasis is with Paul from that point forward. But all of, all of that was a mystery. Paul can build on another's foundation. Yeah. 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 Right. Amen. Yeah. Paul's converted in Acts 9. The conference takes place at least 14 years later in Acts 15. So by the time that those 14 years have passed and some additional years where Paul's been writing these epistles, you're talking, you know, 20 to 30 years. After the prophetic timeline has been interrupted here, Peter is addressing the remaining members of the little flock with doctrine in 2 Peter. Now that, 
That's at least interesting to think about. Why is God doing it that way? Why, why would he wait 20 to 30 years into the dispensation of grace to give Peter scripture to address to the little flock in regard to the satanic policy of evil that was against them and will be especially against those out there when the program resumes? Well, I think it's because the satanic policy of evil is going to seek to utilize this and what's been made known through Paul's apostleship to cause the members of the little flock to be led astray. Because if you think about what, what's happened here, prophecy's been moving along, they're believing that the kingdom is at hand, that's what's been preached back here. They know the prophetic timeline. Their expectation is to be able to walk alive into the kingdom. If they endure to the end, this is a generation that actually could walk into that kingdom according to the timeline. And now all of that's come to a screeching halt there in the midpoint of the book of Acts. 20 or 30 years of it have passed. And you're looking around and what Peter and the apostles were preaching back here, the kingdom's at hand. The Lord Jesus Christ is going to be sent back from the Father's right hand, physically coming to execute wrath upon his enemies and establish and restore the kingdom to Israel over here. They're saying it's at hand. The time is fulfilled. It's on the doorstep and the wrath of God's going to proceed. They're preaching all that back here. Selling their goods in expectation of enduring to the end because there's going to be no profit to them out here because we're going to go in and get the true riches in the kingdom. That's what they've been preaching right here. And yet now 20 or 30 years have passed and you're looking around and there's no kingdom. There's no return of the Lord Jesus Christ. He's not sitting on David's throne there in Jerusalem. Israel has not been delivered from the hands of the Gentiles. They've not been exalted. The blessings that's talked about in the prophets are not there. The convenient thing for somebody to say is, hey, what y'all were preaching was just cunningly devised fables. You just followed cunningly devised fables in this kingdom doctrine you're talking about. 30 years have passed. No kingdom. How much more now when we know that it's we're 2,000 plus years into the dispensation of grace when it resumes and the remnants over here 2,000 years and there's no kingdom. What are, you, what are you talking about gospel of the kingdom? Physical return of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's nuts, isn't it? It people back then and it is now too. Yeah. And the satanic policy of evil knows that. It's going to utilize the mystery interruption. If they're not aware of that and understanding of what that's about and why the prophetic program didn't continue on, that becomes a means when you're looking around and if you don't know what's in the mystery, what it meant for prophecy, you can begin to waver in that profession of the kingdom and thinking that God's not faithful to his promise. And especially over here, going to be seeking to say, you know, it's, it's been so long. The issue of the time. How can you have any confidence that God's going to do what he said. The, the easy thing to say is, in view of this, has the word of God taken none effect? God didn't fulfill what he said. That's one of the things, by the way, that Paul had to address in Romans chapter 9 about that very issue of the dispensational interruption. Because yeah. The easy thing to say is the word of God not, had none effect. It couldn't bring to pass what God said in connection with prophecy. That's why it didn't come in the time frame expected. And Paul's got to argue against that and talk about what's been made known. What God's doing and revealing, it, revealing the secret that's interrupted prophecy. They've got to understand that. And here Peter's addressing that with the little flock. Because that's an issue that if they're not aware of it and they don't know it can be utilized to cause them to fall from their own steadfastness and the doctrine which they have believed and the, the promises that they have received of God. I think that you can see that in a few passages here. If you go back with me to 2 Peter chapter 1. Second Peter chapter 1 and beginning at verse 15. 
Peter says, Moreover, I will endeavor that ye may be able, after my decease, to have these things always in remembrance. Verse 16, For we have not followed cunningly devised fables, when we made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For he received of God the Father honor and glory when there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory. This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And this voice which came from heaven we heard when we were with him in the holy mount. We have also a more sure word of prophecy. Whereunto ye do well that ye take heed, as unto a light that shineth in a dark place, until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation, for the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. All right, and then you got the chapter break, but really the, the thought it's continuing, right? He's, he's talked about how that they're not followers of cunningly devised fables. They've been eyewitnesses of his glory in the Mount of Transfiguration there. They've got the more sure word of prophecy. The scripture testifying to this reality. Men spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. The promise of God in connection with what they believed in the kingdom. But he says, but there were false prophets also among the people. From the time when those holy men of God were speaking as they were moved by the Holy Ghost, testifying of these things, there were false prophets among them, contradicting what the Word of God said. There were false prophets also among the people. He says, even as there shall be false teachers among you, who shall, or who privily shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them, and bring upon themselves swift destruction. All right. See, the, the issue with these false teachers and the, uh, the, the contradictory doctrines that they're bringing in, it's, it's, they're, they're saying exactly what Peter denies in verse 16. They're, they're coming along and they're saying, hey, Peter and the apostles have just followed cunningly devised fables. They made known unto you the power and coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. When they were preaching about that, they were just following cunningly devised fables. It was just a bunch of dumb stories by Galilean fishermen who were overzealous in their following of Jesus of Nazareth. They're preaching the kingdoms at hand, the wrath's coming, you know, all this stuff. It was just a bunch of cunningly devised fables. And I mean, what, what other proof would you need it to? Because like, they're talking about the kingdoms at hand. 20 or 30 years have passed. There is no kingdom. There is no deliverance for Israel. You can't see any of that. It's just a bunch of cunningly devised fables. Why would you follow those guys in their doctrine? See, see the you see the 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 allurement of that. How, how that that could that could cause you to fall from your own steadfastness and the issue of, of a belief in the doctrine of the kingdom. It's not happened the way that we expected. But Peter says we have not followed cunningly devised fables. When we made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. Our Peter was one that was there in the Mount of Transfiguration where the, the Lord was transfigured before them. And they saw him in the glory of the kingdom there. They were eyewitnesses of these things. Their ears heard the voice from heaven that identified Jesus of Nazareth. And God the Father bore witness to him there in the Mount and said, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. He says, we've seen it and we've heard it. We, we've had the experiential knowledge of him in his glory and seen what that means in relation to the kingdom. We're, it's not cunningly devised fables. We've seen it and heard it. He says, but also, also in addition to what we've seen and what we have heard, you don't have to rely upon the eyewitness of Peter or James or John as the assurance of what you believe because he says we have a more sure word of prophecy. Even more sure than what our eyes have seen and what our ears have heard. He says we've got a word of prophecy. The word of God is testified to these things concerning his son. It's recorded in the word of God that the, the Christ will return from heaven. Execute judgment against his enemies. Establish the kingdom and restore Israel. And fulfill all his plan and purpose. You can rely upon it because the word of God promises it. Better stay with word. You look at the 
provision. Mm -hmm. The things you're going to see, there's going to be one going to show you things that if you're looking at sight, you'll believe that. Yeah. There's a stick with that. Amen. That's the more sure word of prophecy, no doubt. He says, We're not followers of cunningly devised fables. Now, that's what it looks like. If you don't know the ministry of the Apostle Paul that he's pointing them to at the end of the epistle, what this means in relation to the prophetic timeline, it'd be easy to look around and to be dissuaded and think it is just a bunch of cunningly devised fables that they followed. It'd be easy to do. False prophets are going to be saying that type of thing. They're going to be denying the Lord, bringing in damnable heresies. And don't you know that when the program resumes over here, we're already out of here, right? We've been raptured out. The body of Christ is in heavenly places, and this program's back in effect. Don't you know that the policy of evil is also going to be using those epistles of the Apostle Paul to try to cause these members of the remnant out here to walk out of sync with the doctrine that they're supposed to be walking in line with? The, the, the satanic policy of evil would love to have the little flock over here not have a rightly divided understanding of their doctrine. They're going to go to the Bible and find Romans to Philemon and say, hey, it's in the book. Black and white, it's promised. There's no wrath of God coming. It's all grace and peace today, right? Just look what Paul says. Grace and peace, grace and peace, grace and peace. Amen, There's no wrath. That's right. Peace, peace. When over here there is no peace, saith my God to the wicked. He's going to be doing the same thing over here with them that he's doing today in the dispensation of grace. Amen. Just like with us, he wants us not to have a rightly divided understanding of scripture. And to go back over here into things that God said in black and white to Israel back here and start ordering our lives based on this. Or to fast forward and jump over here to Hebrews of the Revelation and start ordering our lives and walking according to this. And through this, we're taken captive by the adversary. We're not built up in the faith that the Lord Jesus Christ would have us to be built up in. Failure to rightly divide the word of truth caused destruction. Today, that's, that's what he's trying to do today, right? But in view of the mystery and what's made known, once we're out of here and all this is over, this clicks back in. And they're supposed to be walking according to what was spoken back here and by their apostles over here. Don't you know the satanic policy of evil would love to bring them back over here and get them to import grace doctrine over here and start trying to walk by that? Yes, sir. Peace, peace. There is no peace. That's the way the devil works, folks. It's not just enough. We say it all the time. It's not just enough to be biblical. You've got to be dispensational and rightly divide the word of truth. Know the program. And what's being dealt with. They, they've got to know that. Peter is pointing them to the, the epistle of the Apostle Paul to say, hey, this is what explains the mystery, long-suffering of God, account that this is salvation. God's got a purpose in salvation that's being made known through Paul. Don't, be, fall, don't fall from your own steadfastness. Don't be like those that are unlearned and unstable and they rest the scriptures and they use it out of its rightly divided context and thereby they fall from their own steadfastness. Don't be like that. You know these things before. I've told you. You know what the long suffering's about. And what it means to your program. You don't have to be deceived by that. I'm not followed cunningly devised fables. But the false teachers will be saying they are. Speaking evil of the way of truth. Causing many to follow their pernicious ways. Jump over to chapter 3. Verse 1. Peter says, This second epistle, beloved, I now write unto you, in both which I stir up your pure minds by way of remembrance, that ye may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets and the commandments of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior, knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lusts. And what is their scoffing? What do they say? Verse 4, and saying, here it is, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. 
For this they willingly are ignorant of, that by the word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water, whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water perished. But the heavens and the earth, which are now by the same word, are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. But beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. See the issue of the time? Time's a problem. When it comes to contradicting prop, uh, uh, prophecy, the prophetic timeline, if they don't understand the interruption... And he says in verse 9 that the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness. See, they're looking at this and they're saying that God's slack concerning his promise. That's how they count slackness with God. He's not done what he said. The word of God has taken none effect. But he says that the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness. But, here's the truth, he is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. He's being long-suffering in a purpose of salvation. He says in verse 10, But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heaven shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat, and the earth also and the works that, therein, that are therein shall be burned up, Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversation and godliness? Looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth, wherein dwelleth righteousness. Wherefore, beloved, seeing that ye look for such things, be diligent that ye may be found of him in peace without spot and blameless. And account that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation. Right, this is how you're to think about this mystery long suffering. Account that it's salvation, even as our beloved brother Paul also, according to the wisdom given unto him, hath written unto you. As also in all his epistles, speaking in them of things in which are some to be hard, are hard to be understood which they that are unlearned and unstable rest, as they do also the other scriptures, unto their own destruction. Ye therefore, beloved, seeing ye know these things before, beware, lest ye also, being led away with the error of the wicked, fall from your own steadfastness. But grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, to him be glory both now and forever. Amen. See how he's addressing these, these issues that the satanic policy of evil is going to seek to utilize to cause him not to be steadfast? It's usually the mystery interruption to undermine their faith if they don't properly understand it. I think that gives you some insight into why the Lord Jesus Christ would have Peter write this second epistle concerning what the satanic policy of evil is going to be using against them out here 20 or 30 years into the dispensation of grace. Enough time has passed where you can see the, the elements forming there. and There's, there's a, an issue there that Satan is going to utilize with them that wasn't outright talked about back here because the mystery had not been revealed. But now that it has been, Paul's ministry has been made known. Peter understands it. He's aware of it. He knows what it means in relation to prophecy. He's able to come behind that and address the members of the remnant and talk about how that they don't need to allow this to take them away from their hope. And out here, they don't need to be looking back into this and getting trapped in, into this doctrine, thinking that this is what God's doing when they need to be walking according to the rule of the prophets and the apostles and what they've spoken in the commandments of the Lord. The satanic policy of evil will seek to utilize God's word against the saints. All right? If you're ignorant, you'll be victimized by the policy of evil. That, that's true in the dispensation of grace. That'll be true in the ages to come for the remnant. How many times does the Apostle Paul say to us, Brethren, I would not have you to be ignorant of thus and such. Right? Those are the very things that the satanic policy of evil seeks to keep men ignorant of. 
And it's the ignorance of those things that keeps us in a mess in the dispensation of grace. The similar principle is going to be true with the remnant as well. If they're ignorant of the truth, they're going to be led away with the error of the wicked. They're going to fall from their own steadfastness. That roaring lion is going to devour their faith because they can't resist him steadfast in the truth. And so Peter dealing with these things and uh, picks up on it. We'll come back next time. I'll give you a little bit of an outline to the, the way the doctrine flows through there. But just wanted to show you tonight how that he's addressing the, the satanic policy of evil against them and what that, how that works in relation to the mystery. So I hope that's been a help to you. Thank you for your attention tonight. Let's pray. Our God and our Father, we are grateful for the time tonight. We thank you for these saints. Thank you for their attendance to the word. We pray that what's been shared tonight would be in service to their edification and that it would be an encouragement to them to go on and to study these things out further on their own and to look into the, the details of the, the scripture and to uh, come to a greater understanding of your plan and purpose, uh, not only with us, but um, throughout time and all that you have purpose to do. And we give you the thanks and praise and all the glory in Christ's name. Amen.